On the final day of the Patisier World Tournament, the attention of the crowd was fixed on a particular contestant. This contestant was a man who harbored a dream of creating the most exquisite dessert in the world. He had dedicated years of his life honing his skills, preparing to compete in the grandest culinary competition. Guiding his team, he meticulously crafted a magnificent phoenix sculpted entirely from sugar. It seemed as though victory was within his grasp, and spectators already believed he would be crowned the champion. However, tragedy strikes as the giant phoenix topples over, crushing our hero and tragically ending his life. With his dreams of creating the world's finest pastry unfulfilled, he laments his fate. But in a moment of divine intervention, the voice of God speaks to him, offering him a second chance to share his extraordinary talents. Reborn in the sovereign territory of Molten as Pastry Mill Molten, our hero finds himself in a land that was once desolate but has flourished under the leadership of his father, Casserole Mill Molten, the Viscount of the Molten Territory. Together, they have tirelessly worked for over two decades, transforming the barren fields into fertile soil capable of yielding bountiful crops. Now, the territory of Molten consists of three villages, each with a population of approximately 40 people. At the age of nine, Pastry is learning the art of sword fighting from his father, who pushes him to become a formidable warrior. However, Pastry's true passion lies in the creation of delectable sweets, a calling he carried from his previous life. Yet, there's a hurdle in Pastry's path. The territory of Molten lacks the ability to grow sugar, which poses a challenge for his confectionery ambitions. As he contemplates this issue, one of his subordinates, Sheets, brings him a report. The good news is that they are expecting a bountiful harvest of beans this year, thanks to Pastry's suggestion of using sparkling lime on the field, which enhanced the crop yield despite the famine plaguing the rest of the kingdom. Sheets also delivers the bad news, neighboring regions have recently battled a group of bandits but failed to eradicate them entirely. Now, these remnants of bandits are headed towards Molten, a force of 50 strong. If they infiltrate Molten, they will plunder the precious crops and destroy the hard-earned fields. With only 30 adult men in all three villages combined, Pastry realizes the odds are against them. Casserole considers seeking aid from Count Rates, the nearby ruler, but Sheets cautions against it, citing the potential political consequences. If the villagers defeat the bandits that the Count couldn't, it could undermine his authority and lead to tensions between them. Sheets suspects that the Count may even prefer the bandits to ravage Molten, allowing him to swoop in afterward and claim what remains. Concerned about the threat to his dream of building a kingdom of sweets, Pastry becomes resolute in his determination to stop the bandits, no matter the cost. Impressed by his unwavering commitment, Sheets devises a plan that involves making pastry their secret weapon. He suggests subjecting pastry to the sanctification ceremony, a ritual that may bestow him with magical powers or other extraordinary abilities. That night, Casserole shares his decision with his wife and pastry's mother, Agnes, expressing the gravity of the situation and the plan to make their son the key to their defense against the bandits. Agnes initially hesitates when considering the sanctification ceremony for pastry, feeling he might be too young for such a significant event. However, Casserole assures her that Pastry's skills surpass those of other children his age, affirming his readiness. Agnes doesn't press the matter further and instead prepares to dress Pastry in the most adorable outfit she can find, even if it's traditionally meant for girls. After all, uniqueness is key. Pastry's older sister, Josephine, shares in the excitement of dressing up Pastry, as if they have their very own living and breathing doll. On the day of his departure, Pastry feels a bit exhausted from all the fussing and styling his mother and sister have done. Agnes approaches him, encouraging him to give his best, while his best friends, Mark and Lumi, are there to bid him farewell. Mark expresses a desire to dress up in fancy attire as well, but Lumi playfully dismisses the idea, claiming it wouldn't suit him. This light-hearted banter between friends momentarily takes their minds off the impending departure. Casserole instructs Sheets to take care of matters in his absence, and then utilizes teleportation magic to transport pastry to the royal capital, an awe-inspiring display of power that astonishes Mark and Lumi. Agnes and Josephine, still clinging to the idea of pastry wearing a dress, find themselves in playful disagreement. Upon their arrival in the capital city, Pastry's attention is immediately captivated by the array of food, particularly the sweet treats. It becomes evident that Molten lacks the necessary ingredients to create such delectable delights. Witnessing his enthusiasm, Casserole offers to buy him something special after the ceremony. Pastry finds it challenging to decide which treat to choose, as he wants to sample them all. However, his gaze fixates on the apples, sparking a sense of wonder and inspiration within him. Determined, he resolves to acquire them after the ceremony and even suggests to his father the idea of planting apple trees. Casserole recognizes Pastry's motivation as a desire to establish a strong and prosperous territory, which fills him with joy. Meanwhile, Pastry's primary focus remains on his vision of building a candy kingdom, a land brimming with sugary delights. Together, they proceed to the church, where a renowned priest known amongst the nobles awaits. Casserole has consulted this priest previously for his daughter's sanctification ceremonies, and now it is Pastry's turn. 
The priest is taken aback upon learning that pastry will undergo the sanctification ceremony at such a tender age. Meanwhile, Josephine and Sheets engage in a conversation about the significance of the ceremony and how it bestows magical abilities. Josephine shares her own experience, revealing that she was deemed to possess low magical power, leading her to forego certain aspects of the ceremony. She hopes that Pastry will exhibit a stronger magical potential. Meanwhile, Pastry finds himself bound and blindfolded, given only occasional sips of bitter water. The priest explains that magic is a hidden power residing deep within individuals, and enduring such hardships is the means to unlock it. One and a half days pass, and Casserole grows increasingly concerned about the duration. However, the priest reassures him that more time equates to greater magical potential. Despite the reassurance, Casserole remains worried. In the midst of his confinement, Pastry's mind teems with excitement as he envisions the myriad of creations he can craft using the apples. Pies, tarts, caramelized apples, the possibilities are endless. Suddenly, a peculiar golden light envelops him from all directions, penetrating his being. Shortly afterward, Pastry awakens from the darkness, stirred by his father. Casserole congratulates him on successfully completing the ceremony, signaling the final stage, the priest's recitation from the sacred scripture, serving as both a blessing and an indicator of Pastry's magical attainment. The priest delves into lengthy passages from the scripture, and during this recitation, Pastry experiences a vision of his past life as a renowned pastry chef, as well as insights into his current reincarnated existence. Understanding dawns upon him regarding the scope of his abilities granted by this unique rebirth. Magic begins to surge within him, simultaneously manifesting through the radiant lights descending upon him. With that, the sanctification ceremony draws to a close. Both Casserole and the priest stand astounded by the magnitude of magic that has imbued pastry. The priest remarks that pastry has acquired more power than an average individual would possess. Casserole expresses his gratitude to the priest, compensating him for his services, and they part ways. The priest, though receiving only silver coins, expected as much from a minor lord who had gained his territory through battles. He muses that the payment is insufficient to ensure his silence. Now at the market, Casserole and Pastry peruse the offerings. Pastry takes an ample amount of time deciding between two apples, one appears heavier, while the other boasts a more vibrant hue. His perfectionism when it comes to food renders the choice difficult. Eventually, he purchases his preferred selection, and the shopkeeper even grants him additional apples due to his genuine enthusiasm. Finally, Pastry relishes the taste of apples, the fruit he had been unable to enjoy since his reincarnation. It is a truly marvelous experience, one that Casserole also savors. Pastry suggests to his father that they keep the fact that they indulged in the best pieces of the apples a secret from the others. They continue savoring their fruit, with Pastry eagerly mapping out plans for apple pies, apple tarts, and apple candies, all building towards his dream of establishing his own kingdom of sweets. On the contrary, the priest examines the coins and deems them insufficient to secure his silence. He threatens to expose Casserole's purpose for visiting the church. Meanwhile, a group of bandits wreak havoc upon a nearby village, setting it ablaze and looting its valuables. They revel in their ill-gotten gains amidst the flames, seemingly content with their actions. Three weeks elapse, and the villages diligently prepare for the impending assault by erecting barricades. News of the bandits' attacks reaches their ears, but Casserole and his son have already returned from the capital. It appears that the bandits are moving faster than anticipated, indicating their arrival well before the projected two-month deadline. A landlord instructs his son to deliver a message summoning the leaders from each village under his jurisdiction for a meeting. He also requests the presence of his other two retainers, Cointro and Les Age. Following the meeting, the smaller settlements evacuate their homes and converge upon the larger village, streamlining their defense efforts by concentrating their forces in one location. This strategic move also serves as a bait, enticing the bandits into a trap with their abundant food supplies, which can sustain the residents for up to seven days if rationed carefully. Pastry oversees the preparations and realizes they are still vastly outnumbered. This disparity will become even more apparent if the battle prolongs. His self-proclaimed lieutenants, Marcarello and Luminito, join him. It is revealed that they are the children of Casserole's retainers, and they anticipate inheriting their parents' positions and supporting Pastry when he assumes the role of landlord. After discussing their plan, Pastry instructs them to gather rocks, as he has a strategy in mind. They carry out his command until dusk, when they spot the bandits approaching in the distance. Hastening back to warn everyone, they take their positions. Casserole delivers an inspiring speech to boost morale, and as they get into formation, the landlord and the head retainer embark on an aggressive reconnaissance mission. Pastry is entrusted with leadership in his father's absence. Casserole informs his son that they will strike the bandits fiercely and then retreat, luring them through the northern entrance. Just as his father turns away, Pastry orders Marcarello to inform Cointro at the Western Canal that they will employ flame arrows as a signal for the enemy's arrival. Luminito is tasked with notifying Lesage to prepare these fiery projectiles. 
The arrows are to be unleashed at the faintest sound of hoofbeats. After the landlord departs, Pastry plans to utilize the children's proficiency in launching rocks with catapults to their advantage. They form a unit and await orders, but if danger draws too near, their escape to safety is paramount. Pastry's sister consoles some distressed girls amidst the chaos. Meanwhile, Casserole and his trusted companion approach the bandits, using magic to gain a clear view of their positions before launching their surprise attack. Chaos ensues, and they swiftly withdraw after inflicting damage. The bandit leader attempts to order his men to stand down, but their heated fervor compels them to pursue their assailants. Glossage, upon hearing the hoof beats, signals for the volley of arrows to be released, aiding Casserole and his companion in finding their bearings and leading the bandits into the trap. A hail of arrows and rocks rains upon the bandits, further disorienting them. This tactic proves effective until the bandit leader scales the village wall and initiates an assault. This disruption in the volley grants his men an opportunity to climb after him. The children valiantly hold their ground, continuously hurling rocks at the leader. In a moment of desperation, the leader targets the children, but Pastry intervenes and takes the blow. However, he unleashes his magic for the first time by projecting the pain and damage inflicted upon one bandit to all those standing in the compound. The bandits collapse in agony, creating an opening for Mark Rollo to knock out the bandit leader with a well-aimed rock as Pastry watches with a mix of relief and awe. After the battle, the field is scattered with discarded weapons and broken barricades. A villager approaches Pastry's mother with good news, they have captured some bandits. Worried about her husband and son, she asks about their safety. Her husband assures her that Casserole is fine, but Pastry got hurt in the arm. Concerned, the mother falls to the ground, but her daughter comforts her, saying it's just a minor scratch, which the villager confirms. Although relieved, Pastry's sister wonders where their father and brother are, knowing their mother tends to worry. Meanwhile, Pastry points out the extra food supplies for the smaller settlements, as they handle the logistics. The rest of the villagers escort the bandits to a temporary prison. Thalia is curious about what Casserole plans to do with the captured criminals. She suggests shipping them to the county of Reese as the best option, allowing the leadership in Regis to take credit and save face. The head retainer also wonders about the rewards they can expect in return for their service. Casserole acknowledges the need to evaluate the situation but insists on at least receiving compensation for campaign expenses and the losses suffered while protecting the other two villages. With the bandits safely detained, Casserole organizes a ceremony to honor the villagers' bravery. Marcarolo and Luminito are called forward and given swords and bags of barley as a token of appreciation for their exceptional assistance to pastry throughout the ordeal. Marcarello feels a bit shy about the praise since he's more accustomed to being scolded for his behavior. Pastry eagerly helps his friends carry their rewards, taking them to Marcarello's home. His mother is overjoyed to see her son safe, and his younger siblings are impressed by his achievements. She hopes Marcarello didn't cause unnecessary trouble for Pastry, but he remarks on how bravely they all fought and how vital his friends will be for Morton's future. Next, they visit Luminito's home, where her grandfather beams with pride at her confidence despite her young age. The other villagers join in the celebration, bringing drinks and food. The festivities begin, and even the children participate, drinking milk to feel included. The adults repeatedly praise the children's ambush and how it turned the tide of the battle. Lost in thoughts of creating delicious sweets, Pastry decides to start with an apple pie, already planning the recipe in his mind. This gives Marcarello and Luminito a chance to slip away. Luminito admires her sword while Marcarello tries to impress her by asking about the bandit's motives. He receives an answer, learning that they are currently held in the main village shed. Intrigued, they plan to investigate, understanding their future roles as Pastry's retainers. However, the prison guards at the entrance refuse them entry, citing safety concerns for children. Marcarello signals Luminito to join him in the bushes nearby. With a clever plan involving throwing stones at a log storage behind the shed, they successfully divert the attention of the guards, creating an opportunity for them to enter. Carefully, they inspect the prisoners, but their confidence wavers when faced with the intimidating gaze of the bandit leader. Despite their attempt to show bravery, fear still lingers within them. The leader notices the sword Marcarello carries and asks about its origin. Marcarello explains that it was a reward, unaware that the sword once belonged to the bandit leader himself. The leader, accepting his fate, expresses a desire to teach Marcarello swordsmanship and even magic. Intrigued by the idea of becoming like pastry and possessing magical abilities, Marcarello is captivated. However, Luminito senses something wrong and advises Marcarello against listening. Unfortunately, Marcarello has already been enchanted by the leader's words and falls into the trap, disarming himself when drawn closer. Exploiting this moment, the bandit leader frees himself and attacks Luminito, causing a wound on her torso. By the time the guards return, the leader has taken Marcarello hostage, while Luminito remains unconscious on the ground. A concerned villager witnesses the distressing scene and quickly informs the others about the gravity of the situation. At the shed, the bandit leader finds himself surrounded by more villagers. 
However, he cleverly uses Marcarello as a shield to secure a horse and escape, leaving his comrades behind. Soon after, Pastry arrives and immediately attends to Luminito's injury. The guards inform Pastry that the bandit leader has fled with Marcarello. Determined to pursue them, Pastry hopes that the traps they set along the escape route are still in place. He plans his attack, intending to retaliate and redirect any harm he receives back onto the criminal. In the worst-case scenario, he aims to force a stalemate. Suddenly, a realization dawns on Pastry regarding his ability to replicate what he witnesses, prompting him to consider its further application. Back in the village, news of the incident reaches Casserole and Thalia, who express disappointment in the guard's failure to apprehend the boy. Casserole instructs the head retainer to accompany him in intercepting the bandit leader before he reaches potential allies for regrouping. Fuli suggests that Casserole goes alone to allow him to prepare and maintain morale within the village. Meanwhile, the bandit leader's progress is impeded as he falls into one of the traps set by the villagers. This fortunate turn of events allows Pastry to catch up. The leader recognizes Pastry and assumes he is responsible for the trap. Surprising the bandit, Pastry draws his sword, leading to a duel between them. Pastry initiates an attack, but the criminal withstands it, acknowledging Pastry's impressive skills despite his young age. However, the bandit's superior physical strength sends Pastry flying backward. Undeterred, Pastry regains his composure and continues his assault. Determined to eliminate Pastry with a single decisive blow to prevent him from replicating injuries, the bandit leader forcefully pushes Pastry back. Witnessing this, Marcarello pleads with Pastry to flee, believing that his own life is not worth risking. However, Pastry firmly refuses, reminding Marcarello of their strong bond as lieutenant and leader. Sarcastically remarking on their friendship, the bandit leader launches a powerful attack. Pastry manages to block it, but his blade shatters, leaving him vulnerable to a subsequent strike. Without hesitation, the bandit leader seizes the opportunity to deliver a blow. Meanwhile, Fai uses his scouting magic to search for Pastry and Marcarello but finds no sign of them. Growing increasingly anxious, he shouts in the hopes of receiving a response. Eventually, he discovers horse tracks, indicating that they are getting closer. A look of dread washes over Fai as he spots Pastry's broken sword. They continue their search until dusk, yet find no trace of the missing boy. Fai returns with the shattered sword in hand, contemplating how to deliver the heartbreaking news to Casserole. The leader of the guards opens the door and is surprised to see Pastry unharmed, resting peacefully in his mother's arms. Casserole informs the leader that Pastry returned with Marcarello not too long ago. Pastry's mother refuses to let go of him and has fallen asleep while holding her son. Although Casserole is puzzled about how they passed by without notice, he asks Pastry to explain. At first, Pastry avoids giving details, but when pressed, he admits that he replicated his father's teleportation magic on himself to escape the bandit's fatal blow. Pastry explains that his magic allows him to copy anything, including other people's magic spells, onto another object. Confirming Casserole's suspicions, Pastry's revelation leads his father to forbid him from revealing his ability to others and establishes a rule against using other people's magic in front of anyone. Casserole scolds Pastry, cautioning him about the dangers of using unfamiliar spells. Pastry had anticipated this reaction, which is why he was hesitant to share his secret. Later that night, Casserole and Fai discuss the potential consequences if news of Pastry's unique power spreads. They worry that some people might try to exploit him as a weapon and regret not capturing the bandit leader earlier. Casserole hopes that the bandit leader will be dealt with before he has a chance to expose Pastry's secret. The next day, Pastry joins Marcarello in preparing marinades and is reprimanded for causing Luminito's injuries. Pastry assures Marcarello that Luminito will recover and suggests they visit her to apologize. When they arrive, Luminito is in good spirits and happy to see her friends. Pastry excuses himself to the kitchen to bake an apple pie, while Marcarello offers a formal apology to Luminito. The enticing aroma catches their attention, and soon Pastry returns with the freshly baked pie. They are amazed by its appearance and comment on how delicious it looks. Pastry explains that he made the pie to uplift Luminito's spirits. Excitedly, they taste the pie and are delighted by its incredible flavor. Pastry also shares some fresh apples soaked in honey, educating them about the different apple varieties and their tastes. Pastry advises Marcarello to learn from his mistake and work hard to improve, assuring him that he will always find ways to use his unique skills. Their conversation is interrupted when Glossage enters the room, pretending to be angry about Marcarello causing harm to his daughter. However, Glossage quickly changes his tone and suggests that Marcarello can make amends by marrying his daughter. Luminito overhears and doesn't object, surprising Marcarello. Luminito then offers Glossage a slice of the pie, and he compliments its deliciousness. They all sit together, enjoying more pie, and these joyful moments reinforce Pastry's determination to create his land of sweets. A month had passed since the bandit incident, but another problem arose. Casserole and Fuel approached Pass, informing him that they were broke. Initially, Fuel didn't pay much attention, knowing Casserole's tendency to claim they were broke. However, Pass was concerned and wanted to help solve the situation. 
Casserole explained that they had to shut down two villages due to the bandit attack. Now they needed to rebuild the houses and dig out the wells. Moreover, they had to provide provisions for all the villagers, and the fields needed repair. But they had no money for all these expenses. They were supposed to get 200 gold pieces as a reward for capturing the bandit leader, but Mark's blunder with Duroba ruined that opportunity. Casserole thought about borrowing money from another noble, but they were unwilling to lend anything. Nearby lands were damaged during the winter, and the bandits' attack added to the woes. Casserole also considered seeking financial aid from the court nobles in the capital, but their interest rates were exorbitant. Pass asked if they could ask his grandparents for help, but Casserole revealed that Pass's parents had cut ties with their families 15 years ago. As a result, Pass's grandparents were unaware of his existence, making it impossible to seek their assistance. Moreover, when Pass wanted to marry Casserole, his family was against it due to their poor lands, leading them to run away. Feeling overwhelmed, Casserole decided to call it a day, realizing that overthinking wouldn't solve anything. Pass returned to his friends and shared the situation with them. Mark advised him not to hide anything from them, as they could also provide help and support. Trying to change the topic, Pass inquired about Lumi's recovery. She mentioned that she could already go out but still experience some pain. Mark suggested expanding their fields to cultivate more, but they lacked the time, manpower, and funds to do so. Lumi mentioned that Pass could sell his sweets in the city, but he couldn't afford the production costs. Mark playfully suggests that Pass should teach magic, thinking it could make him rich. Lumi teases Mark, saying if he uses magic he might set himself on fire since he's clumsy. Pass joins the fun, calling their argument flirting, and Lumi suggests magic might be their solution. She proposes that Pass shows them his magic to spark ideas. Remembering his past life, where he discussed new sweet ideas with colleagues, Pass decides to give it a try. He asks Mark and Lumi to draw something on the ground. Mark draws himself defeating a dragon with magic, while Lumi draws a playful bonka. Using his magic, Pass copies the images into their hands. Lumi tries to rub it off, but Pass explains it's permanent on trees or walls and fades in three days on skin. Curious, Lumi wonders if Pass can do the opposite, copy something else as a drawing. Pass is puzzled at first, but Lumi clarifies, suggesting it'd be cool if he could project images of houses or faces on the ground. Mark dismisses the idea, but Pass realizes Lumi's given him the answer he was seeking. He calls her a genius, making her blush. Pass gets shy and apologizes, then goes to meet his father. Meanwhile, Casserole discusses their situation with Fuel and his wife. They consider asking for money from her parents but aren't sure. Suddenly, Pass storms in with a plan. He asks his father if he remembers trying to arrange a marriage for Josie, Pass's 13-year-old sister. Pass explains that his father can introduce Josie to other nobles using his teleportation magic. Some nobles can't use magic and must attend a costly and dangerous royal ball in the capital. Pass proposes they sell matchmaking photos. To illustrate, he uses his magic to create a detailed portrait of his mother on wood. Casserole and Fuel are amazed by its precision, and his mother feels like she's looking into a mirror. Pass's goal is to use his magic to create pictures of nobles seeking a marriage partner. Casserole sees this as a perfect opportunity and suggests they can charge 5 to 10 gold pieces per picture, or even more, as some parents won't mind spending to introduce their children this way. However, Fuel raises the concern that exposing Pass's magic might be risky. Pass explains that they can't hide it forever, and doing this will make people think his magic is only for making pictures. To test the idea, Casserole decides to approach Count Retest since he plans to discuss the bandit situation with her anyway. They arrive at Retestvale City and request a meeting with Count Retest. From the window, she wonders if they want to blame her for not handling the bandits properly. Casserole intends to praise her achievements and then talk about the pictures. Inside, they meet Count Brio's retest, and Pass recalls his father briefly introducing her as the eldest daughter of the previous count. Her father died in battle, and she assumed authority until the rightful heir came of age. However, that heir also died mysteriously before reaching adulthood. Casserole pays his respects to Brio's, who remarks on Pass's charming appearance. Pass approaches her but notices she's carefully observing their behavior. She invites them for tea, and Pass's attention is immediately drawn to the cookies. She explains that they're a specialty of her land and prepared with the best tea. While Casserole politely praises her tea's aroma and flavor, Pass finds the cookies to taste horrible. Brio's is puzzled since most kids love any kind of sweet. Pass takes a sip of the tea, yet it disappoints him too. Casserole continues to be polite and praises Brio's for excelling in both military and agricultural matters on her land. She expresses her desire to learn his secrets and knowledge, not realizing that many changes were actually thanks to Pass's advice. Casserole drops the bomb by revealing that most of the land's improvements were due to Pass's insights. Brios, understandably, finds it hard to believe that a child not even 10 years old could oversee the cultivation of a wasteland. She praises Pass, thinking he must be proud to have such an amazing father. Casserole and Pass have been eagerly anticipating this moment, their hearts pounding with excitement and determination. 
As Brios engages in conversation with Pass, he senses the perfect opportunity to unveil his master plan. With a mischievous glint in his eye, he starts by expressing genuine pride in his father's accomplishments. But then, like a crafty strategist, he skillfully introduces a bold lie that his father's land was raided by several hundred bandits. This audacious move is aimed at gaining an advantage in the impending negotiations. Brios, taken aback by this unexpected revelation from a mere nine-year-old, struggles to maintain her composure. She silently berates herself for allowing a child to delve into such serious matters. Yet, she cannot deny the cleverness and bravery of Pass's tactic. Undeterred, Pass presses on, continuing his offensive. He divulges that the captured bandits spilled the beans, revealing their origins in Retest Vale. He tantalizes Brios by hinting at the possibility of delivering a few bandits for her interrogation, subtly implying the potential involvement of the royal family in an official investigation. Brios tries to counter his claims with a display of bravado, boasting about their triumph against a formidable bandit group. She suggests that perhaps some survivors fled to Casserole's land. However, Pass skillfully recalls Fuel's initial report, recounting the bandits' brutal assault on Retest Vale before turning their sights to Casserole's territory. Intrigued and determined not to be outmaneuvered, Pass then throws a daring question into the mix, who exactly fought against the bandits if they were not involved. Brios, fueled by her pride, hesitates to admit defeat and boldly challenges Pass to provide proof for his claims. In a pivotal moment of the negotiation, Casserole steps up, revealing a sword emblazoned with the Retest family crest, incontrovertible evidence that the bandits indeed originated from Retest Vale. Brios is left in a state of realization, knowing that her claims of vanquishing the bandits were, in fact, false. Pass tells Brios that Retest Vale's failure to deal with the bandits caused damage to Casserole's lands. Even though they don't want trouble, Pass insists they should be compensated. Brios offers 100 gold pieces, but Pass says it's not enough to cover all the losses. Brios is impressed by Pass's maturity and negotiation skills, so she raises the offer to 130 gold pieces. Pass stays firm and rejects it, leading Brios to increase the offer to 150 gold pieces. Though surprised to be outmaneuvered by a child, she agrees, realizing Pass is exceptional. After signing the contract, Brios acknowledges the positive impact Pass had on Casserole's land, giving him credit for its prosperity. She admits underestimating him due to his age and the compensation amount. However, she knows it's a small price to pay to avoid losing the king's trust. Brios then brings up Pass's reaction to the tea and cookies during their meeting. Curious, she asks if something was wrong. Pass diplomatically suggests that the treats were too sweet and proposes adding something less sugary to complement the tea. Before Pass can explain further, Casserole playfully stops him and signals it's time to leave. Pass apologizes for not bringing a proper gift but uses his magic to create a portrait of Brios on a piece of cloth. She's amazed and grateful for the thoughtful gift. As they bid farewell, Pass and Casserole feel proud of their successful negotiations and the respect they earn from Brios. They step into the world with confidence in their unbreakable bond and the power of friendship and creativity to guide their future adventures. The story continues as we see the secondary estate of Duke Cattlesec, located at the royal capital. Pastry and Casserole attend the coming-of-age celebration of the Duke's eldest heir. The Duke takes shots at his grandson, calling him a child despite being grown, but Casserole glosses past those comments and expresses his honor to be invited to the banquet. The Duke is flattered to hear such words coming from a hero of Casserole's stature. The Duke officially introduces the man of the hour and adds that the young man graduated first in his class at the officer's boarding school. Squale blushes as he expresses how much of a privilege it is to meet the war hero. Casserole encourages him to be more informal with him since Squale is of a higher rank. The Duke reveals that his grandson idolizes Casserole and has been looking forward to meeting him, which is why he's behaving like a fangirl. The youth present are big fans of Casserole, and their conversation then turns to Pastry, who introduces himself in such an elegant manner that they are in awe. The Duke has heard that Pastry has also come of age and wants to know if he was blessed with magic. Pastry confirms the statement, which makes the Duke happy, as it is clear that both father and son are gifted, and the mortal household has earned God's favor. He asks Pastry to demonstrate the kind of magic he was bestowed with. Pastry pleads for the cloth of one of the waiters and, as he holds it, uses his magic to replicate the portrait of Lady Petra. Everyone is impressed by the quality of the picture, and the Duke takes it, as he has the magic to create pictures. Squale is smitten by Lady Petra, and Pastry reveals that the portrait is a gift for Squale on behalf of himself and Margrave Hubrick, the Duke's third daughter, who is not in attendance. Pastry explains that Lady Petra is the third daughter of Lord Huberick, and he and his father made a trip there earlier, where they met her. Casserole explains that the land of Margravate is constantly feuding with its neighbor, creating a challenge for Lady Petra if she were to leave their territory. So Hubrick asks them to introduce her on his behalf. Squale finds her so charming, and the father and son look at each other smugly, as the debut of their service seems to be going well. 
Pastry continues his next display by informing Squail that Petra will be having a celebration for her coming of age, and he was hoping that Squail would attend as an expression of interest. Squail interrupts his grandfather just as he's about to reject the idea and expresses his willingness to go. The Duke looks at him like he's a fool, reminding them that they need to make certain considerations before responding. The Duke can see that Casserole and Pastry are trying to play Cupid, and he knows that Pastry is not to be underestimated just because he's a child. The Viscount tries to stall by bringing up the traveling challenges, but Pastry addresses it with his father's teleportation magic. The boy realizes that the Duke is a little apprehensive about the meeting, so he privately discloses some information. During his visit, he realized that Hubrick had an ulterior motive for wanting this marriage. Pastry believes that the Lord has grown weary of the constant border feuds. The Viscount doesn't understand how all of this is relevant, but the boy explains that Hubrick wishes to use the powerful military that the Duke controls to diminish the opponent's fighting spirit, which would end the feud forever. The Viscount's face relaxes as he thanks Pastry for the insight, stating that he will keep that in mind when making the final decision. The Duke then makes an official announcement that he, too, will be going to the celebration and hopes that his grandson will find his romantic destiny. He informs Casserole that he will be putting himself in his hands. As the party continues, Squail joins Pastry and expresses his intention to become friendly on a first-name basis. He asks Pastry more about Petra and what she likes, as he's interested in knowing the kinds of things she enjoys. Pastry informs him that it appears she likes sweets and that he presented her with some handmade cookies on their first meeting, and she seemed to like them. Squail asks Pastry if he's skilled in making sweets, and Pastry happily shares how much he enjoys making them. Squail then brings him back on topic when he starts to get carried away, expressing his desire for Petra's portrait to be a little more sensual, but Pastry can see the thirstiness in Squail's eyes. Some time passes after the celebration, and the father and son are back on their territory. Everyone is still busy working to restore the villages. Casserole has decided to personally bear the cost of food and firewood while they undertake the restoration. Fi comments that it is unheard of for a lord to go out to earn money to make life easier for his subjects. Casserole understands that it might not be dignified, but he's willing to do whatever it takes to ensure his people don't starve. Pastry interrupts their discussion as he presents some letters that have arrived for his father. One is from the Duke, and the other is from Huberic. Casserole reads both letters and informs his son and head retainer that they have a windfall coming their way. They will be paid 20,000 silver coins for matching Petra and Squail. The engagement has been agreed upon, and from the letter, it seems like they plan to announce it privately when Petra comes of age. Pastry is ecstatic, knowing that all the hours spent producing the matchmaking photos were worth it, as it took two days for Hubrick to approve the final portrait. Casserole continues that they will also receive an advance of 30 gold coins for the funding of Petra's security detail. Hubrick wants them to keep her safe throughout the whole process. They are well aware of the potential opposition to the union between these two powerful households, so they must be cautious and keep the engagement a secret. Pastry points out that the church might pose a problem, and Casserole agrees. He reveals that the church is officially a neutral entity, but a large enough bribe can loosen their tongues. However, since they are also neutral, they have access to a lot of information that would be difficult for others to obtain. Casserole can effectively protect Petra herself with his teleportation spell, but the challenge lies in transporting her guards and other attendees to the capital. They need to secure guards for her at the capital if he transports her alone. The head retainer hopes that they can keep this secret engagement discreet and avoid any leaks. Phi points out the risk of hiring aid in the capital, as unsavory agents might infiltrate their hires. However, Casserole is determined to successfully complete the job and earn the trust of two major players in the kingdom. Pastry agrees, as it would also help him achieve his dream of creating a land of sweets. He comes up with the idea of using the true sanctification ritual chamber, a secure place with no windows and thick walls, to keep Petra safe during the coming-of-age ritual at the capital. They will pretend her ritual is running longer, but in reality, she'll be in the chamber until the engagement is announced. Everyone is happy with the plan, and Flight suggests repurposing the 30 gold coins if they don't need to hire mercenaries. Pastry presents a receipt for materials he bought from the traveling merchant, which included apples and sugar for making sweets. Casserole scolds him for using the funds for personal purposes, and his allowance is revoked. On the day of Petra's transport, Casserole and Pastry are welcomed by Hubrick. Casserole explains Pastry's presence as keeping Petra company, but in reality, Pastry is there to oversee the plan secretly. He greets Huberak, who attributes the success of the marriage to Casserole's magic. After the formalities, they enter the carriage where Petra is already inside. She greets them warmly and thanks them for accompanying her. Casserole compliments her, and Pastry expresses his greeting as well, mentioning how she enjoyed the cookies he gifted her. Petra excitedly confesses that she's been dreaming about the cookies ever since Pastry gave them to her. Pastry begins to explain the process of making sweets, but their conversation is interrupted by Petra's mother, signaling that they are in a hurry. 
Casserole apologizes, and they enter the carriage. After sitting, Pastry greets Lycoris, Petra's younger sister, who responds with a dry attitude. Petra encourages her to be more forthcoming, considering the risk they are taking to escort them. Lycoris asks for forgiveness, and Pastry doesn't take her rudeness to heart. They move on, and as everyone sits in their seats, they discuss the plan. The first stage is to enter a church within the Margravate borders, claiming it's for true sanctification. From there, they will teleport to the church in the capital, where Petra will stay in the chamber until the engagement is announced. They already have a unit there to stand guard. Huberek warns Casserole that those seeking to harm his daughter are making their move, but Casserole assures him that his men are prepared to protect her as they move through the streets. The enemy follows them in the shadows. When the carriage arrives at the first church, they step out with their swords drawn to ensure it's safe. Unfortunately, the enemy launches an attack, but the fathers fend them off. Another attacker emerges, but Pastry stops him, vowing not to let anyone harm the ladies. Casserole joins in, and they defeat the attackers, who flee when they realize they are outmatched. Huberak commends Casserole and Pastry for their service and expresses gratitude for protecting his daughters. Lycoris becomes fearful, but Pastry assures her they are safe, as they are all together. The story continues as Pastry gently holds her hand and assures her that she's safe, making her blush. After comforting her, Pastry guides her down, which leads her to ponder about Pass, who is younger but behaves maturely. She wanted to hold her sister's hand, but she believes that Pastry is the only one who doesn't compare her to her sister. She has always been indecisive and thinks that her sister was chosen as the bride because she's prettier. Consequently, she doesn't have a high opinion of herself and feels like she's just an extra. She remembers behaving unpleasantly towards him when they first met, but he still helped her. As they reach the end of the stairs, Petra asks if they will perform the sanctification ceremony there, but she gets startled when Pastry replies negatively. He explains that his father will use magic to teleport them to the capital where they will proceed with the ceremony. Petra and Licorice feel relieved as Pastry guides them inside the room and instructs everyone to hold hands together. They follow his instructions and hold each other's hands, then Casserole uses his magic to teleport them to the church in Bovalia. Meanwhile, on the other side of the city, there is a peculiar man residing in a dilapidated house. He gathers a group of mercenaries and explains that he has summoned them to take on a task, which will aid him in rebuilding the Armenia house. He reveals his plan to strike a blow against the Cattlesec family. The mercenaries, driven by the lure of money, inquire about whom they need to eliminate. To their surprise, the man instructs them not to kill anyone but to bring a specific woman, Petra, to him. If successful, they will be rewarded with ten pieces of gold. The leader of the group asks if Petra is an aristocrat, to which the man confirms, emphasizing that they must not fail. After the group departs, they discuss the man's arrogance, as he concocted this entire plan to become an aristocrat. They cannot comprehend his intentions and fear they will be blamed for taking Petra. The leader explains that the man's plan has two objectives, to tarnish the Cadillac's family reputation and to present himself as the savior of Petra, aiming to become an aristocrat by marrying her. This ploy exploits Petra's parents' desire to maintain their status by protecting her innocence. Meanwhile, back at the church, Past observes the heavy security outside the window. Casserole informs him that those are the underlings of the Margraves. Past finds it impressive but also remarks on their family's inability to gather such a substantial force. Petra expresses her concern about the engagement, feeling uncertain. Past assures her that once she meets Squall, she will realize her feelings. He tries to be a wingman by speaking highly of Squall. Petra becomes affectionate, describing Squall's portrait as kind and lovely, and Past thinks the engagement photo had a powerful impact. The Margrave arrives and informs Petra that the panda priest is waiting to commence the ceremony. Fuel joins them, and Casserole asks about the situation at the Cattlesec house. Fuel explains that there is a large crowd and even nobles from distant territories are arriving. Casserole elaborates on how the marriage will unite the Margrave and Duke's families, resulting in the formation of the strongest noble house. Casserole entrusts Pass with an important mission to accompany Licorus to the reception room until Petra finishes. Pass's father explains that Licorus appears somewhat tired, which Pass had not noticed. Fuel whispers to Pass that he should be empathetic and escort her. Acting on the advice, Pass approaches Licorice, acknowledging that it might be difficult to rest in that place. He informs her that they have prepared a separate room for her to rest. Though hesitant, Licorice shyly accepts his offer and holds his hand as he guides her. Fuel seizes the opportunity to call Pass a womanizer in jest, advising him not to make a woman cry. Casserole scolds Fuel, telling him not to teach such things to Pass. Meanwhile, the other peculiar man is celebrating with wine, vowing to make Cattlesec pay. Simultaneously, the carriage and guards arrive at the church to escort Petra, and she leaves with her father after completing the ceremony. Casserole and Fuel observe them departing and mention that only Licorice remains. Casserole explains that their mission will conclude once they escort the Margrave and his daughters back home. He expresses contentment that everything has been going well so far but remains wary of the large crowd. 
Despite dealing with a significant number of suspicious individuals, they cannot afford to let their guard down, as some potential threats may still be undiscovered. Fuel expresses concern about Pass, worried that he is spending time alone with an unmarried girl in the same room. Casserole assures Fuel that Licorice's sanctification ceremony is about to begin, so there's no need to worry. Besides, she has a formidable protector, Pyrrha, accompanying her. Pass is a bit puzzled since Licorice's primary guardian should have been Petra. Pyrrha, the maid, seems a bit aggressive as she explains that her role is to protect Licorice, which startles Pass. He asks if she can relax, but then he senses something amiss. Suddenly, Pass hears a strange noise, and the ground begins to shake, causing a massive hole to appear in the floor. Both Licorice and Pass fall into the pit, and Pyrrha shouts for help. Rushing to the room, Casserole examines the situation and deduces that a mage created the bottomless pit. He instructs Fuel to inform the Margrave about the situation and then jumps into the pit. Meanwhile, Pass regains consciousness and tries to make sense of what happened. He realizes that he and Licorice are tied up. Inside the pit, the mercenary leader, whom they encountered earlier, speaks up, offering to explain the situation. However, Pass confidently replies that he already knows what happened. The leader says that Pass will be released if he behaves properly, but Pass is more concerned about understanding why they were taken hostage and how long it will take for his father to find him. He ponders he should not be kidnapped as his family is poor but looking at Licorice he realizes that the mercenaries are after her. The mercenary leader instructs one of his men to keep watch over them before leaving. He warns Pass that any attempt to act will result in his death. Without a second thought, Pass resolves to protect Licorice. Casserole finally reaches the end of the vast, seemingly endless pit but realizes that the culprits have already escaped. Licorice regains consciousness, and Pass asks if she comprehends the situation. He explains all he knows and encourages her to remain calm. Although initially worried, Licorice decides to trust Pass. The guarding mercenary dismisses Pass's actions as an attempt to show off. Pass identifies the earlier guy as their mage but remains cautious about the others, determined to gather more information. He begins questioning the new guard, seeking to understand their fate. The guard explains that they only need Licorice, so Pass might be killed. Undeterred, Pass attempts to locate their whereabouts, but the guard refuses to answer. Pass then employs a strategy, pretending to cry and plea for an explanation. Annoyed, the guard threatens him, but Pass claims to be the eldest son of an aristocrat and states that his father could pay a ransom of 200 gold pieces. He even adds that his father would pay even more if the person behind the plot is a noble. The bandit considers the idea of taking the ransom for himself and running away. Pass observes the surroundings and deduces that this place once belonged to a duke family that fell ten years ago. He recalls reading the list of potential threats during Petra's escort and realizes that only one duke was listed, the Duke of Armenia. Using his magic, he copies the information onto a ribbon belt and then employs his father's magic to teleport it to his father. Meanwhile, Casserole returns to the church in search of more information. Fuel also returns and informs Casserole that the Margrave has decided to prioritize Petra's engagement, making it difficult to mobilize his men. Casserole understands the situation and acknowledges the difficulty of the decision. He mentions that there might be a way to take action if they can identify the attackers. The maid, recovering from her shock, scolds Casserole for seeming cold when Pass and Licorice were taken away. Casserole explains that he has confidence in Pass because he knows that Pass is with Licorice, which brings some comfort. Suddenly, a light appears in the room, and the ribbon with the copied information materializes. Casserole takes the ribbon and reads the details, revealing that Pass and Licorice are being held at Armenia's estate. They come to the realization that someone from the former Duke family is responsible for the abduction. Casserole instructs Fuel to gather some of the Duke's men, while he himself mobilizes volunteers from outside the church. Meanwhile, the mercenary leader enters the room with anger, as he has just realized they mistakenly captured Licorice instead of Petra. He attempts to attack Licorice, but Pass swiftly uses his magic to teleport next to her. However, Pass receives a punch from the leader. The other mercenary is perplexed by Pass's sudden movement and inquires about what happened. The leader explains that they won't receive payment because they abducted the wrong girl, and the engagement announcement is currently taking place. Pass grasps the true intentions of the bandits, but there is no time to think. The bandits intend to kill them to eliminate any witnesses. The leader focuses on Petra, but Pass selflessly puts himself in harm's way, using one of the standby swords to protect her. He knocks down the other mercenary and attempts to face the leader, who is bewildered. Feeling relieved, Licorice witnesses Pass's bravery. Pass assures her that he will be by her side. Meanwhile, Pass steps forward and urges the mercenary leader to surrender. However, the bandit leader refuses, claiming that the battle has just begun. In response, Pass confidently declares, this is checkmate. Pastry gets ready for more attacks while the mercenary leader sizes up the situation. He regrets lowering his guard because Pastry was younger. The young noble quickly escaped and defeated the lieutenant. Things worsen as Casserole and the others raid the estate. 
Our Meyer watches with concern as they charge, while Pastry continues facing the leader. Licorice calls out to Pastry, and he assures her of their safety and reinforcements. The mercenary admits he's in trouble and plans to retreat. However, Pastry doesn't intend to let him escape. He holds the leader back until Casserole and Glossage arrive. Retainer rushes to free Licorice while the father and son attend to the criminal. As they close in, the mercenary points out the disadvantages of the room they're in, but Pastry remains determined. The leader uses magic to create an escape route, and Casserole tells his son not to follow. With the threat gone, Casserole expresses relief for Pastry and Licorice's safety. The retainers from Cattle Sack and Huberic House join them. The Huberic retainer confirms Licorice is unharmed and returns her to her father. Pastry smiles and waves as she's taken away. They head down to oversee the capture of the offenders. The young noble asks about the mastermind behind this. Casserole reveals it was Armeyer, caught trying to escape secretly. During the war 20 years ago, the Armeyer family lost their title due to suspicion of aiding the enemy. Casserole uses this to teach his son how a lord's actions can affect the family's destiny. One of the men tells Casserole that the dukes are waiting at the estate to hear their report on the incident. The father and son step back, entrusting the task to others while they go after the leader. They rush off before the head retainer can complain. As they search the area, they speculate where the mercenary might have fled. Pastry starts to doubt the leader's escape, considering the circumstances. When Pastry inspects the escape hole, he senses little residual magic power, suggesting the leader couldn't have gone far. Since they have men surrounding the estate, Pastry questions whether the leader could have escaped unnoticed. They return to the room where Pastry talks to the mercenary. The leader, named Strudel, reveals himself, impressed that Pastry saw through his plan. Strudel planned to make it seem like he escaped, biding his time to slip away once everyone left. He readies himself for a fight, but Pastry insists on a one-on-one -on -one duel. Strudel finds it amusing and questions if Pastry can back up his words. They introduce themselves officially, and Strudel discloses his name. He abandoned his family name years ago. Pastry's preference for a duel suits him since he believes he has the advantage in strength and experience. Strudel attacks, and Casserole watches nervously. Pastry blocks the attack, breaking Strudel's sword with a swift counter. Casserole apprehends Strudel as he's knocked out. Curious, Strudel asks how Pastry defeated him. Pastry hints at the importance of not losing sight of one's weapon on the battlefield. Casserole examines the broken sword and realizes what Pastry did. Pastry explains how he replicated the damage on a nearby wall to compromise the sword's integrity. A month later, Squail and Petra's official engagement party takes place at the royal castle. The newlyweds seem happy as they greet important attendees. Casserole and Pastry are amazed by the luxury, privately announced or not. They are interrupted by the Duke, and they exchange greetings. The Duke thanks them for their work in resolving the situation and expresses gratitude to Pastry for protecting Licorice. Pastry humbly mentions he did it out of duty. They discuss Squail's immaturity, but Casserole and Pastry assure the Duke that he'll be fine. Pastry takes the opportunity to discuss some interesting aspects of Licorice's capture. After explaining everything, the Duke realizes that Pastry suspects he might be the third party who provided misleading information about Petra. The Duke orders Pastry to stop talking, and Pastry plays the innocent child card. His father warns him to stop as well. With some leverage, Pastry subtly convinces the Duke to support the expansion plan. Back home, Pastry reveals his reason for providing misleading information to troublemakers. He intended to frustrate the wrongdoers, not to have Licorice taken captive. However, he's unimpressed by Pastry using this mistake to gain an advantage. Their discussion is interrupted by Hubrick, who wants to express his gratitude to Pastry for saving his daughter. Hubrick confirms Pastry's sanctification ceremony and offers Licorice's hand in marriage. Licorice agrees, surprising Pastry and his father. Given the Hubrick family's rank, they officially announce the engagement. Licorice thanks Pastry for saving her, and he's taken aback by her elegance and charm. A toast is made to celebrate the good moments around them. Squail and Petra are happy about becoming in-laws with Pastry. After the party, Pastry watches the sunset and Licorice joins him. She gives him cookies she baked to show her gratitude. After tasting them, Pastry finds them salty but politely tells her they're delicious, making her happy. Pastry makes a promise to protect her smile for the rest of his life. He's confident that with her by his side, he can bring to life the land of sweets he often dreams about. The story continues as Casserole tells Agnes that he wants her to stay calm and listen carefully. Agnes wonders if Casserole has bought something expensive again, but she says she won't get angry over that. Casserole then reveals that he has a new girl in his life. Agnes is surprised by this news. Casserole explains that it wasn't intentional, it just happened unexpectedly. Agnes asks Casserole to provide more details about the girl. Casserole describes her as beautiful and from a well-respected family. She's also a twin. Agnes becomes upset with Casserole. He acknowledges that he should have asked for her approval first, but their son Pastry agreed to it. He believes that the girl is a suitable match for him. Agnes realizes what Casserole was talking about. Their child, Pastry, asks how Agnes is handling the situation. 
Casserole says Agnes will need time to process it. Agnes is happy to have another daughter. The scene shifts to the Reedes County, where a man informs Count Reedes that the heir to House Mortal is engaged to Margrave Hubrex's daughter. This news surprises Count Reedes. She asks the man which girl from House Hubrick is engaged. The man explains that it's the fourth daughter, Licorice Mill Hubrick. The Count remembers that she was recently kidnapped. The man suggests that the engagement might be a way to prove her purity after the kidnapping. He thinks Hubrick might wait a few years to dissolve the engagement, once the memory of the incident fades. The Count realizes that Hubrick's true intention is to reassure others about their family. The man understands that the alliance with House Cattlesec has increased Hubrick's influence. The Count notes that Hubrick wants to take a different approach by aligning their house with a smaller one like Mortal. The man thinks this will show that Hubrick isn't pursuing power through marriage politics. The Count adds that Hubrick believes the land of Mordalen has potential for growth. The man believes it's not possible, but the Count explains that 20 years ago, the land was barren, and it took several years to get the first successful harvest. In the last three years, they switched from growing wheat to cultivating beans, using them as fertilizers to enrich the soil. This change improved their wheat harvests afterward. The Count suggests that all of this might be due to the actions of the silver-haired boy. The man finds it unbelievable, as the boy is just nine years old. The Count reminds the man that the boy handled negotiations to compensate them for bandits and outsmarted her in the process. She thinks Hubrick must have noticed the boy's potential and outmaneuvered her. The scene shifts to pastry in a village called La Malad and the Thief of Mortal. Boxes are delivered to him. Mark and Lumi are curious about the contents. Pastry explains that these are supplies he requested from Duke Cattlesec. He secured the Duke's support during the engagement. Lumi notices small trees inside the boxes, and Pastry identifies them as black locust saplings. Lumi playfully wonders if Pastry plans to make black locust pie, but Pastry explains these trees are for growing honey, a crucial ingredient for sweets. He points out that they are easy to grow but face challenges due to the region's low rainfall. Mark asks about water, and Pastry suggests making a reservoir to collect and store water year-round, particularly since the land experiences little rainfall. The scene changes to Sheets calculating the year's profits from textiles, wheat, and emergency aid. The total profit is four gold. Casserole expresses relief and mentions that their persistent efforts have finally paid off. Sheets recalls the uncertain beginnings when they first arrived. Casserole reflects on the ups and downs of the past two decades but notes that their hard work has been rewarded. Sheets attributes a significant role to Pastry in their success, and Casserole sees his son as a kind of savior. Casserole expresses gratitude to Sheets, Cointreau, and Bazé for staying with him all these years. Sheets mentions that he made the decision to stand by Casserole a long time ago. Sheets then says he has two more things to tell, and there's both good and bad news. He asks which one Casserole would prefer to hear first. Casserole decides to start with the good news, wanting to keep the positive vibe. Sheets shares that their new village, La Malat, has received more than 40 applications from settlers, mostly refugees. Casserole realizes they need to speed up preparing the village since they already have so many applicants. Sheets is confident they'll manage with the new workers they have. Casserole then asks about the progress of his new retainers, and Sheets mentions that the five they hired after handling Lady Licorice's kidnapping are being trained by Glass Age. Casserole is pleased with this and asks about the bad news. Sheets reveals that Pastry has started a new project with his friends. Casserole wonders what Pastry is up to now and decides they'll go find out. The scene shifts to Pastry and his friends in a desolate area. Pastry uses his excavation magic to create a hole, impressed by the usefulness of the magic he learned from Strudel. He plans to use this magic for his plan. Mark and Lumi are surprised by his actions, and Pastry keeps digging to create a reservoir. Pastry explains he will plant saplings around the reservoir to collect rainwater, forming a synergistic effect. He believes everything is going well and he's excited about using this magic to improve his land of sweets. Pastry's daydreaming is interrupted when Mark and Lumi tell him to open his eyes. Pastry realizes his father and Sheets are present, making him nervous that he might have gone overboard. Casserole gets angry and smacks Pastry and his friends. Meanwhile, in the county of Reedes, the Count is still concerned about House Mortal's connections. She mentions that she might have made the same decision as Hubrick if she had a daughter. She's particularly frustrated that Cattlesec and Hubrick collaborated without consulting her. The man with her suggests she could marry Pastry herself, but she dismisses the idea due to the age difference. She wonders if there's a way to guide Pastry. She gets an idea and the scene shifts back to the Mortal villages. Now have irrigation channels, and the villagers are impressed. They've heard that Lord Pastry created three ponds in less than a month. Pastry arrives and checks on the progress. Cointro reports that things are going well and the saplings are planted. Pastry discusses their plans once they have honey. Josie arrives with an urgent letter for Pastry. She speculates it might be from Pastry's fiancé and brings it to him. After reading the letter, Pastry discovers it's an invitation from Count Reedes for a tea-tasting ceremony. Pastry wonders why the Count specifically asked for him. He suspects she might have some hidden motives. 
The scene changes, and Sheets is showing their new worker, Niccolo, around. Niccolo wonders why there's so much work to do, thinking he could relax in this rural place. Sheets explains that he can blame Pastry for their busy schedule. Pastry arrives and clarifies that everything happening in Mordalen is under his father's authority as the Lord. He mentions that his father's decisions are the reason for their busy routine. Sheets questions who bypassed the current lord to build a reservoir, and Pastry explains he did it on behalf of his father, the next lord. Sheets advises Niccolo to express his complaints to Pastry, and Pastry asks about his father's whereabouts. Sheets says his father is in the royal capital, prompting Pastry to reveal he received an invitation to a tea-tasting ceremony from Count Rides. He suspects the Count might be scheming something and wanted to discuss it with his father. Casserole, Pastry's father, mentions he heard about this event in the royal capital from sources other than the Count. Pastry wonders about the Count's intentions, and Casserole suggests they can discuss it later. He brings in an important guest, Licorice. She enters and expresses her anticipation to see Pastry again. Pastry responds warmly, and Licorice explains she's not just visiting. Circumstances require her to stay here for a while. Pastry is surprised by this news. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe our channel, Annie Explainer.